we need a theorem and nope. I have a kazoo. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that one. Live from the Plutopia News Network, this is the Plutopia Happy Hour. Our guest this evening is our friend Gary Gock. The not ready for prime time players are all here. <laughs> our... <laughs> you, you forgot the internet is not ready for prime time, but, uh, but okay. we, we are. are. <laughs> yes. Well, we're joined by our foreign correspondent, Maggie Duval. Our not so foreign correspondent, uh, Susie Sheeler, and our alien correspondent, that's me, uh, Scoop Sweeney, <laughs> and our designated guru for the evening, John Lubkowski. Uh, actually, the designated guru for the evening is not John Lubkowski, but is Gary oh, no, don't Gock. Say me, don't say me. <laughs> no, like, Gary Gock. I didn't is prep. I didn't prep. <laughs> he is the guru. He's a, He's an author, he's a translator. He's an editor, he's a teacher, and he's a poet. He lives on in, on Russian Hill in San Francisco. His work's been translated in several languages, has appeared in several anthologies, numerous periodicals. And I think your latest book, Gary, am I correct, was Pause, Breathe, Smile? That's right. Good. Which is... A terrific book, especially if it can get you to do what it tells you to do. <laughs> Pause. Breathe. Breathe. Smile. There's an audio, too. Oh, excellent. Yeah. What's on the audio? Tell me about the audio. What is, is that like that? And, and I, I don't know if this is the right terminology. The EFT? Is it like got those noises where you fall asleep to or make you relaxed or is it um an You mean binaural beats? <laughs> yeah, yeah, or is it No, or is actually it, uh... it's it's the author reading the book. Oh, that's fantastic. Are you on will you be on Audible or are you already? It's yeah, well, audio books have uh, they're all there's no they're not exclusive. Oh, that's so fa uh, well, you I know, have Audible. Audible I mean, so. All the various channels have them. Yeah, unlike the uh uh, special effects recordings, Gary will not put you to sleep. Or so he claims. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Unless you're already tired. <laughs> you know, there's just, there's just a slight shift of emphasis between depressed and depressed. <laughs> but um, other than the spell John, back to you. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to play the slideshow. It worked the other day, but it doesn't <laughs> okay. want to work now. So. Well, John, John will be right back. <laughs> and I'm going to introduce oh, myself. Uh, because... I got it. I figured it out. Oh, OK. So That's... you can introduce yourself because my introduction was yeah. Yeah. hurried. No, the reason I'm here tonight, of all nights, is because when uh, my good friend and editor and neighbor Lawrence Ferlinghetti went into the light at the age of 101, just before his 102nd birthday, John said, why don't you come on the show so we can, you know, commemorate him. And, uh, you know, I thought of a couple of the uh, uh, high points of his incredible life to share with us. And as I uh, prepare to do so, John has very kindly, um, I'm going to share some pictures that I took at City Lights just right afterwards. Like there's a picture of Lawrence, he's haloed by the light from inside. Those are his lettering up above. Democracy is not a spectator sport in his banners. Um, City Lights, you know, is a place of pilgrimage for millions all over the world. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Um, and he, it's, you know, he's, he's illustrated the store. This is, you know, this is, that's his takeoff on a Russian uh, futurist design that he's illustrated. Um, that's when you came in the store, uh, the, uh, the flower altar, a uh, picture of him by calligraphy by Ward Dunham, death to the state, because he's a great anarchist. 
Lawrence once said, you know, anarchism is great, but it would take all saints to make it work. And so he was really more of a Scandinavian democratic socialist. Um, and they put out, you know, his books. The one on the right is the one he published in 1955, his first book from the publishing company that he started, Pictures of the Gone World. Uh, if you can keep the slides rolling, but that was the year, 1955, <coughs> that um, there was a poetry reading in San Francisco at a place they just made up a venue. It was called the Sixth Gallery for that night. And it changed the face of uh, poetry in America because up until then, poetry readings would be like T.S. Eliot would get up, I mean, he'd visit your, he'd visit your college or you'd be on TV and it was, it, it wasn't, you know, it was like we talk, you listen. It was, there was no sense of community. And instead, Kenneth Rexroth, who was an elder uh, bohemian in San Francisco, invited five of the younger poets that he had under his wing, Gary Snyder, Michael McClure, Philip Lamantia, Philip Whalen, and Allen Ginsberg, who had just written a week ago a poem when he was, that's a whole other story, it was called Howell and he read the opening. I don't know if you've ever read Howell, but oh, yeah. oh, yes, it has absolutely. biblical lines. He would take a breath and he would read this entire line and people would say, yeah. And then he'd read another line and people would say, go. And it was like, by the end, everybody was like, it blew the roof off the place. And Lawrence published the book, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Could we have the next slide, please? All righty. Um, it takes a minute for those to queue up. Oh, okay. there you go. Yeah, so uh, his last book is in the upper left, Little Boy, which is a book uh, written, I think, in one sentence without punctuation. And you can get the audio from Peter Coyote reading it, which is oh. great. Oh. Um, and somewhere in there, if we keep on going, we may see the book he wrote two years after the pictures of the gone world called Coney Island of the Mind, which- There it is up there. Is probably, yeah, is probably the most widely known book of poetry in our century. Yeah, it's a new, it's a new cover. It's right up there, yeah. Uh, it, it, I think Kenneth Rexroth connected him to, to New Directions and New Directions published this book by Lawrence Ferlinghetti, no one knew who he was, and it was a, kind of a, a mashup of lyric poetry. He'd been kind of writing like T.S. Eliot, but um, it had a real anti-establishment kind of uh, fresh quality. And there was a healthy dose of European surrealism to it. Uh, if I could give some background on Lawrence, um, making a transition from who he was to who he became. When he was 26, he was in the Navy, uh, one of twenty, one of 10,000 guys. Who, he, had, he had been in Normandy and seen battle. Wow. But what did it was right after that, they assigned him to Nagasaki. Okay. They had no idea what an atomic bomb was. And they go past Hawaii and they realize they're, they're not an attack force anymore. They're going to be an occupation force. And let's see, he says, in the Navy, as in all other military establishments, they tell you just as much as you need to know to perform your part of a slaughter or whatever other murderous commands you've been given. We didn't know anything. We went ashore and there was no one there. The whole town was boarded up, not a Japanese person in sight. When we went over to Nagasaki, it was total devastation, three miles of a landscape of human muck in hell. What was left of bodies had all been cleared away by the time we got there which was about seven weeks after the bomb had dropped. Acres of mud with bones and hair sticking up out of it. It really made me an instant pacifist. I'd been a good American boy in the Boy Scouts, 
etc. Nagasaki really woke me up. He had a teacup on his mantle of his home, which he had for 75 years, which was a teacup. He picked up out of the ruins and saw that it had the owner's remains still attached to the cup. Whoa. Oh. Whoa. So, nice. um, so I was mentioning Kenneth Rexroth. He met Kenneth Rexroth, who was a great influence on him, I think. And I'll just read one poem by Lawrence as we go through the slides, because it, it's it's short. Most of his, a lot of his poems are long poems, kind of like Neruda. This was something he wrote at Kenneth Rexroth's place. Sweet William Blake in a book in Santa Barbara echoes in the eucalyptus. I roll seven chopsticks together and in their clicking hear the sound of last summer's Cicadas. I look westward into the end of day, the last frontier still made of water. So he's becoming a Pacific Coast person, having been an East Coast person. Um, when he was in New York, he uh, emulated the um, abstract expressionist, but soon found a style of his own. And he was as much a painter as a writer. You can see, you know, like his calligraphy is this weird kind of painting. Uh, he kind of invents the alphabet. The H, you know, is, a, is like, what's that? Um, like a ladder or something? So these are signs all over the store. And the store, it was originally a couple of blocks, it was a block up, but it was the first bookstore in America to sell just paperbacks. And it also created a uh, style of bookstore that the chains later copied where it's like a library. It's got chairs, it's got seats. I once asked Lawrence, how's, how's the store doing, Lawrence? He says, terrible. People keep coming into my library and buying the books. <laughs> so uh, the basement had some, the basement was originally a, a, a place, a church, and there was some, some church signs and he kept those. I am the door. <laughs> it was like over a door. And there was a church pew you could sit on. Um, there's his bowler hat that he sometimes did his chaplain-esque persona with. Um, closer look. So when I was just, oh, so there's a long poem of his, Pity the Nation. Great poem, look it up. Um, when I was 15 and we were on our way to the um, Seattle World's Fair, um, we were in a hotel and a stopover in San Francisco. And I said, I'll be right back. What time is dinner? Okay, I'll be right back. There's the upstairs. Uh, they're showing a movie of Lawrence in the poetry room. So we're in San Francisco. I'm 15 and I leave the hotel and I hitchhike <laughs> through the Broadway tunnel into City Lights. It's like, I, people still do this. You're, you want to make a pilgrimage there. And I was in the basement where the poetry was then. And there was a woman who came up to me, a kind of a uh, round face, olive skinned woman. I don't know if she was wearing all black, but you know, you get the idea, like she was kind of a beatnik bohemian. And she said to me, what is the line by Sappho? And I said, I don't know. And she said, I, I'll, I have to find it. And she went to the poetry section she found the book and she said to me, <coughs> death is evil. If the gods were to die, they do it, but they don't. Therefore, death is evil. Something like that. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I saw a book of 
Kenneth Patchen that was, you know, privately printed by uh, a, a, some publisher up north. Um, so the bookstore itself became this kind of center, both as the bookstore and as the publishing house for City Lights books. Um, that's a poem I uh, wrote on the in the book for him. Um, and he published all kinds of poets and originally in the early editions of the pocket poets, you know, a little, not just a pocket book, it's something you could put in your back pocket and take on a hiking trip. These little small square books, Kenneth Patchen, um, Robert Duncan, Frank O'Hara, as well as uh, the Beats. So, you know, by publishing Frank O'Hara, he's linking the East Coast to the West Coast at the same time. You know, he's kind of quite an entrepreneur. And when he publishes Howell, uh, it was busted for obscenity, which uh, was one of the three big trials of our time. It had been Ulysses in 1936, then it was Howell in 1955, and they tried one more time in 1964. Can you remember what it was? The Tropic of Cancer by Henry Miller. The Tropic of Capricorn was racier, but they, no, it was Tropic of Cancer. And, you know, you get guys getting up and saying, no, it's a work of literature, don't, you know. But you got to realize too, in this era, it's like J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye was banned in England. You know, this was a period that after World War II in America of very conservative, triumphal country where the anti-establishment voices were finding their, their little niches like film noir, uh, poetry, um, demonstrations against the bomb. There's his red truck <laughs> in which he'd deliver you know, things to the post office and gave people rides. He lived in Bolinas eventually and came down to the city, but he also had a place in the city. So there's the Bolinas Border Patrol uh, decal as well as, as well as the decal for the uh, swimming and rowing club at Aquatic Park where he swam and rowed. He was a very athletic guy. Um, and, um, you know, the truck is, is not red coincidentally. You know, he was an anarchist um, and published uh, not just the beats. Uh, he published two books by Pasolini, both poems and a kind of an anthology called In Danger, which took a while to prepare, a really good anthology. He published um, Subcomandante Marcos of the Zapatistas in Chiapas. Um, and continued to be, you know, the one who would sign your petition, <laughs> you know, who would appear at a rally. Um, he'd get up in the neighborhood when we had an annual uh, uh, New Year's or Poets event. He'd get up like everybody else, read his poetry, which I don't know how many local people realize was kind of rare because he had an international uh, following. You know, he, he would go to uh, the speaker's circuit of the world poets where, you know, he'd appear on the same bill as Ezra Pound or um, Yevdyshenko and all these, you know, great world poets. But in, Amer in, in San Francisco, it was like, oh, there's Lawrence, <laughs> you know. And he had coffee at the cafe kind of regularly, the 20 minute walk from his house to North Beach to the cafe. Friends could sit at the table, strangers. He'd go into the store, which is the back away, and uh, you know, do some business, maybe borrow a book from his library. <coughs> and um, gosh, how long has it been since then? I guess it's almost a month now. You know, he yes. got to be 101. <laughs> And, you know, his lungs were kind of like, he got to be frail, you know, I mean, at a hundred, by a hundred, 
he was frail and at his 100th birthday, there was a lot of people outside of his house and they had to kind of walk him to the window so he could see and wave and smile. Uh, he told his Italian translator when he was 101, you know, I, I really hard to be alive, but I still want to see the sunlight every morning. So that's my um, brief uh, enconi en encomium for someone who was, um, you know, vaster than the ocean and as very much present as, you know, a guy in his, his two uh, boots. Yeah, I mean, you think back to the influence that he had and the influence that the so-called beat generation had uh, so many of us were inspired by those guys and they were just kind of like every day they'd wake up and do it you know they they were just kind of working through their lives they weren't thinking well maybe they were thinking about influencing people maybe not but I don't think that was foremost on that's mind. a good point john i i did got i just got to jump in and say lawrence never identified with the beats oh interesting he published them he published them you know he re when um coney island of the mind came out he read some of the poems with jazz and those became very famous but the beat lifestyle and ethos and he were they were kind of apart i mean for one thing you know he was adopted by a very wealthy uh, uh, uh sephardic jew no i'm sorry he was a sephardic jew and he was adopted by an italian right a wealthy italian and um you know he had a he had a different background and also, I, I mentioned because, you know, I had a mentor who was a beatnik in L.A. There were beatniks in L.A. There were beatniks in New York. There were beatniks in San Francisco. There was like one in Cleveland. <laughs> you know, if you, you brought all the beatniks in America to, together, it, 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 they'd probably fill one Zoom and that's it. It, it wasn't huge. Well, this raises it, a question. It was just very, very, huh? Well, this raises a question. If you were a beatnik, when you got your instruction manual to tell you how to be a bit beatnik, what did it tell you to do? What what did the beat what made a beatnik a beatnik? Right. They were making it up as they went along. But to, to kind of bring it home to Lawrence, there was this cultural event of both Jack Car there was Jack Kerouac publishing let me go back one one step before i do this or two i love genesis angels by aram saroyan to get a sense of the zeitgeist of what it was like he's writing about lou welch who i knew to get another sense of it if you see the movie killer's kiss not the killers but killer's kiss by kubrick it captures that kind of 50s drab locked in uh meant you know tom thomas wolf mentality and then kerouac comes along he writes this one kind of thomas wolf like book and then he publishes on the road and um uh paris review does an interview with him and the guy that brought him to Paris Review, Blair Fuller, was asked by, I guess it was Plimpton, the publisher of Paris Review, this guy's good, does he have any friends? Right, does he have any friends? So they get Ginsburg. And Ginsburg became the organizer publicist. 
if you read his interview, he says, oh, we all knew Kenneth Rexroth, but then there's Gary Snyder and he does this and there's Michael McClure and he does that. And he just sort of like brings himself to, brings all these people to the table along with himself. And in that interview, people are going, oh, the beats, this is some kind of a thing. It, it, it kind of woke people up, just a magazine, just an interview, just a book. But these ripples started to form, you know, and, um, but you know, the name, you know, is like, they still like, what was the name? Kerouac said it means beatific. <laughs> All but one were Buddhists, you know, Kerou no two, Kerouac was, Kerouac was a Buddhist by then. Lamantia was a Buddhist. But, you know, I'm not, I, I get your question, and I'm also going to now back off because I don't speak for the beats. <laughs> you know, it's like there are people who can answer these questions far. You know, it's like I saw, I saw a movie in the 50s. I think it was, or it might have been the early 60s, called The Beat Generation. And it had like Ray Danton in it, if you remember who he was. Uh, obviously a B movie, right? And it basically showed people kind of like they were sitting around in jazz clubs and it was a black and white movie and they were wearing a lot of, you know, black. I mean, it was kind of like uh, forerunner of goths practically. But um, Did they all have berets on? Well, they weren't beatific, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I think actually there was somebody in there with a beret. I bet. I mean, I think that probably what was happening there with those people uh, was, for one thing, more diverse than any label would suggest, but also it wasn't really quite what people's impression of it was. And this fact that, as you say, there were Buddhists, that's very interesting, you know, and, and actually... There's a lot of them. I became a Buddhist based on advice from Allen Ginsberg. I wrote him a letter and I sent him a poem and he responded to me. And one of the things he said in his response was that I should try, he actually referred to it as Dhyana meditation or Zen meditation. And that sort of set me on the path. And that was when I was like, oh, I was probably 19 years old or 20 years old when that happened. Wow. Uh, but, you know. He, and he answered your letter. Yeah. I mean, it was amazing. I did not really expect anything but i got a really nice postcard from him which i've since lost and uh it's funny he referred <clears throat> he liked my poem he referred to my letter which had a lot of adolescent complaints in it as peter pan yak <laughs> but you know i mean like when you think about the beat generation do you really think about people suggesting that you do Zen meditation or that you, you know, people who are Buddhists or people who are more like Gary Snyder, or do you think about jazz clubs? And I mean, I think, I think there's a lot of confusion about what that really represented. And I think that there was a there there that was not well understood outside of probably that circle of people that's zoom that you were talking about. And like, there were uh, weekend beatniks, and there were people who like had the kind of hip <laughs> lifestyle on in their, you know, they read the books or, you know, so forth. Like Susie, what were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say that as I would say that if you were going to read something and that explained what that group was about, in my mind, of course, I wasn't there, but. Uh, Richard Perenia's uh, been down so long. It looks like up to me. I think is a it captures it, fantastic, uh, just a per perfectly uh, the way I consider the way those folks were. Have you ever read that? Mojo and the masochistic microbus. You what? remember that? Mojo and the mac masochistic yes, microbus. Yes, yes, he was. He's just. I mean, that's when I think of that generation. Of course, Kerouac's in there and. But I feel like that book, that story, just kind of, it, it really kind of made that for me. Okay, that's what they were thinking. That's where they were. Yeah, and Farini was inspired by those people. He was, you know, he was a little after that, but he definitely took a lot of inspiration from um, um, those kinds of writers. His roommate, by the way, was Thomas Pynchon. 
Yeah, and his uh, wife was um, Mimi Joan Bias. Yeah, yeah, Joan Bias' sister. Yeah. So crazy. You... Anyway, that 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 that's what I was thinking though. Whenever I think of that that group of people, I know the names and I know the poems. But as far as just wrapping it all up into a box, as we all like to do, that's kind of where my head goes. Had you read that one, Gary? You know. I worked at the bookstore next to City Lights where he was going to do the signing, which was where he died. Oh, yeah. And then, oh, it, was it was such awful. a shock that I, I, and I knew Mimi later, but I still haven't been able to read the book. I mean, I guess I should. Oh, you you should read the book. Go. It's actually kind of a joyful experience. Yeah. yeah. You will love you it. You brought up another thing. And Susie, you know, you brought up another thing about talking about Mimi and, and whatnot, where, um, and then, John, you were saying as a diverse bunch of people, but, you know, I'll just say, um, the women of the Beats always were kind of second fiddle to the guys. You know, Joanne Kiger was this woman she studied with Robert Duncan, Jack Spicer, and um, actually she knew William Carlos Williams. She brought him to Santa Barbara and held her own. And still, you know, it's like people go, who's Joanne Kiger? And who, and so Brenda Knight has a book about the women of the beats or the beat women. Another thing was that they were not I mean, Lawrence wasn't publishing a diversity of uh, American voices in the sense of uh, ethnicity, uh, class, you know, there were some black writers who kind of like, I showed him my book, but he just dusted me off, <coughs> you know, uh, now City Lights as a publishing company is woke in that sense. Then they're publishing. I think it's sort of. I think Laura, it, it. You can see the change with. Um, yeah, you know they've done this. They've done the Pocket Poets. They have a new series called Spotlight, which is very good. Spotlight poets, but then also Lawrence was the first. Poet Laureate of San Francisco, and all of those poets have been very diverse. The Native American woman, um, the current one, Tongo Eisen Martin, who, if you haven't heard, is this kind of powerhouse of uh, spontaneous social activism poetry. And, um, you know, now they're publishing quite a, a, a good many. Uh, voices from a wide spectrum of uh, what is America. But, you know, then America was still this kind of a little box, you know, and, pe and just to... It was filled with white men. Change just a little, <laughs> just to be a little bit off the tracks was big. I'm seeing this pocket poets list and I see Denise Levertov on there, Marie Ponceau. There aren't many women on here. That's definitely not a lot of women. Go figure. <laughs> right? Right. Pablo Picasso. Janine Pommy Vega took it 1968 before they published Another Woman. <laughs> now, Diane de Prima's Revolutionary Letters, you know, is a great example of by that time, uh, is publishing um, a fellow anarchist and a, a woman. And Anne Waldman was a breakthrough book for them, publishing someone who was kind of a next generation figure um, who became uh, quite a, uh, you know, she and Allen Ginsberg started a poetics program at a college run by a Tibetan uh, Buddhist, uh, Chogyam Trungpa, who felt that for Buddhism to come to America, it would be born on the wings of poetry and so even today, there is Naropa College in Boulder, still headed by Anne, who's this, another force of nature kind of person. Ferlinghetti seemed to kind of 
you know, he gravitated or somehow saw this, he was like a heat seeker. Uh, Barbara Jane Rays is a uh, another current pocket poet who is this dynamite Filipino American poet, uh, very much, you know, kind of code switching between, you know, uh, um, you know, regular uh, speeches she has spoke and, you know, her, um, her own language. Boy, this is great. <laughs> it is great. It's handy. Uh, Gary, uh, yeah. you uh, mentioned that uh, Fernley Getty was a democratic socialist. And did he ever express any views on the current crop the new crop of democratic socialists that have you know, made the news and earned the ire of the Republicans. You mean Bernie? Bernie <laughs> and uh, plenty others that uh, identify now as uh, democratic socialists. AOC. Uh, Lawrence would always be the local and sometimes national guy to go to for a quote. And he has spoken out about that. I was saying, just to dot that I, I was saying that, you know, at heart, he was, he is an anarchist, but he was aware that that's kind of an idealist position and that the real politic, unless you had, you know, a tribe of saints large enough to make anarchism viable, he said he was more of like, you know, Nordic, economics, the Scandinavian uh, socialists. And that now we have the Democratic Socialist Party here. And I don't, you know, actually don't know to what degree they're influenced by um, that particular sense of uh, mixed economy. Maybe you can tell me. I think they're Republicans now. <laughs> I think the Democratic Party is so center that it's really kind of, I mean, all of these people who are offloading from the GOP onto the Democratic side, I think it's hard to tell who they are anymore. I don't, I don't know what they embrace anymore. I mean, who knows? They're, they're snakes. I don't know who they are. They embrace That's social media. <laughs> yes. That's a type of socialism. <laughs> I mean, they, they embrace attention. I think, well, I think politics is a politics of attention now. I don't really think Which way they, the wind's blowing today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they don't care about leading or providing service or anything like that. They just want to, you know, have enough attention to remain wherever it is they are with whatever kind of money they have rolling in. Well, Gary, it's well, all I about opportunity. Sorry. No, I agree. There's Shusie. There's been this kind of weird reversal. So now, if you were to use the old language that we used to use, which is still a very dualist kind of you know way of looking at things, the Republicans are the populists. You know, they captured the the people who felt disenfranchised and lost their jobs and you know, kind of grassroots people. And the Democrats are kind of like, in a way, new conservatives. <laughs> if you look at the standard way of looking at it, but when I was saying democratic socialists like Bernie, and, no. you know, there's the squad uh, of uh, five or six known uh, figures who are representing kind of an oppositional force within the Democratic Party. You know the but, uh, these uh, the I guess the QAnon people and the extremely right wing people, the Proud Boys and all that. They sort of align pretty well with some of the left wing groups of the '60s for sure. I mean, it's they're like the the opposition now and. They're extreme in the same way some of the people on the left were extreme back then. I mean, it's, it's the to extreme. me, the, I, I'll just say, to be, and I, then I'm, I'm talking over Susie for a minute, That's but okay. the idea that there we have two, 
parties or something like that or two sides you know it's kind of a dualist thing because if you go far enough left you're right wing and if you go far enough right you know that you're you're an anarchist so i you know and i think i think also this idea that we talk about we talk about this instead of talking about economics you know the allocation of goods and resources to the private and public sector <laughs> when are we going to have that conversation yeah. irregardless of what what do you call it oh you call it something and, it, and it's bad because <laughs> of the name oh yeah we're not great at, at coming up with names for stuff defund the police was not popular how about we defang the police <laughs> i gotta work with that <laughs> Well, well Gary, you know, uh, Bernie Getty was uh, uh, basically one of the headliners at the BN. And what what was his uh, lasting opinion of the whole hippie thing that uh, kind of emerged from that? Good question. Good question. He once told me he liked the hippies. You know, he said, you know, it's like electric Tibet, he said. <laughs> You know, I mean, and it was no longer this kind of thing where you could fill them all up in a, the back of a hall. It became, this became a whole generation wide, horizontally spreading out kind of a phenomenon. You know, he was all for that. I mean, you know, also given the fact, awareness that there was a lot of, uh, you know, I had a friend who had been a hippie in the hate, an early founding father. And when they were having the run up to the be in, he said he thought there should be counseling stations for the draft because there'd be a lot of people coming from different parts of the country just to be in San Francisco. And they would, they maybe had never heard of the possibility of being a CO, a conscious objector or anything like that. And everybody on the committee said, no. <laughs> you know, it's, so I, you know, I don't know how you could embrace the hippies without, you know, listen hippie kind of, you know, taking them <laughs> aside and, you know, giving them some instructions. But, you know, he was, uh, hippies were all about instructions. You know, kind of, <laughs> They all wore uniforms. Yeah. yeah. It was kind of, I mean, it's kind of funny. It's, you, I was talking about how it's hard to like identify the, the beat generation as being any one thing or that there was really more diversity there. And it's kind of like that with hippie. People who called themselves hippies were kind of all over the map. They were doing all sorts of things <laughs> and they had all sorts of beliefs. And there was... I think that's kind of generally true that people are kind of all over the place with their thinking, yet they identify with a particular label or a particular, I mean, they, there's some like identity object that people can sort of flock around and it helps those people to sort of assume that they have kinship with these other people. Oh, we think the same thing but they may not be thinking the same thing at all, you know, but that's sort of like kind of the other day. Like I, I would very much, I know there are the Lincoln Republicans who are queer Republicans who hate queers. And uh, <laughs> well, I mean, it's true. Really? They do. Oh God. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, they don't, they're oh, yeah. Republicans. They're self-loathing queer people. Yeah. There's um, a there's lots of them in Texas. Oh. And so they decided, they decided to make their own club mm -hmm. um, so that somebody would like them. But what <laughs> I would like to know, I have never, ever met a, an anti-queer um, lesbian. These are all men. Good point. So, mm. I haven't either. You're right. Isn't that interesting? There yeah. would never be a, the the Lincoln Republic. They would just the. Are you kidding me? Wow. No way, yeah. No some way. people have a little a residual macho thing that they're hanging on to, regardless of uh, 
their identity. Does that have anything to do with the fact that when a like cisgendered um, male sees two males getting it on, they get really creeped out and uncomfortable. But if they see two girls yeah. getting it on, they think that's great. They're much more comfortable with that, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. And in my experience, too, uh, uh, there's an organization that uh, shall not be named, but um, led by uh, gay men. And the only women they would hire were very matronly, kind of ineffectual, soft, squishy women. I mean, nothing against these women, but anytime a strong woman would be introduced on staff, she was she was gone quickly. She was gone. And I thought that was interesting. I was like, I'm not going to explain it. I just thought it was interesting. So I'm glad you brought this up, Susie. It's an interesting box. Um, yeah, it's, it's worth talking about because women are going to take over the world pretty quickly. I don't know. Not after the 20 what million jobs we lost during the pandemic as opposed to the 6,000 the men lost. I don't know that we're taking over anything. I don't know. I think women are taking up guns now. I think they're going to come after us. I'm, I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> I mean, I didn't think you would. <laughs> well, you're off my gas list for all <laughs> Oh, I want to sit by you. Otherwise, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I don't know. It's an interesting thing that you sort of watch all the power grabbing going on, and you kind of wonder how are we can get back to some degree of sanity. And I've I've been thinking about that a lot myself. I just read a pretty good paper about that uh, that hadn't been released yet, but it's about you know, kind of how do we reclaim our democracy? The paper itself is really kind of bleak. It says, you know, there's r really no reason that any politician would necessarily want to have a democracy. And the only reason that we've been able to hold a democracy together is because they've been able, it's served their interests well enough and there's been a kind of balance of power. But now that things are kind of thrown out of balance, it could just get worse and worse and worse. And then they talk about some steps we could take to, to address that, uh, which I won't really get into um, since their paper's not out yet. But, but it really is kind of, I mean, it's kind of a problem. You know, we have this, uh, we have this we're sort of downward spiral happening and we really have to think hard about whether we really want to go there. And one way to avoid going there would be for, people who have their heads on straight to really stand up and be counted and, and have a strong voice. And that hadn't exactly happened yet, but I, I can't, I keep thinking it's going to happen. I keep thinking that people are just going to start speaking up, you know, you'll probably be the first Gary. I don't think there'll be a, a voice. It'll be voices. Right. I yeah. Think the, I think that what we will hear will be communities speaking mm -hmm. for a change. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, we've got the, that would make sense too, because we've got the collapse right and left of the, the guru system, you know, like right and left, a new one's investigated in another community that's been led by one person you know, this hierarchical thing, right. um, I find right. that really interesting. So right. yeah, I agree with that. Like, and what I think a lot about imagining what, what a world like that would be, what would it, what would it be like if we were all speaking with these voices and it was communal? So, well, you know, I've noticed that uh, communities, you know, even here in Texas, local uh, communities are beginning to stand up and take, uh, take charge of, of uh, their existence, uh, like with uh, vaccines. There are some communities that have given up on, on the state of Texas coming to their rescue, and they've gone to the extent of finding their own sourcing for vaccines or doing shuttles to another state where it's more available. And you're seeing uh, things like that happen in local communities that you won't see at the governmental level. There's too much bureaucracy too much, uh, you know, too many people in power that really don't want to see a whole lot change. We probably need more people like Lawrence Ferlinghetti. 
Well, I mean, we're status quo. That's what we do, right? We fight and fight and fight and fight, but we're status quo. I mean, we make these little bitty advances and then something comes along like, I don't know, school shoot. Well, you use school shooting when mass, you know, murders were bad um, and not all over the place. But I think, um, I don't know what I was saying after that. <laughs> I know that, um, that, that Wayne LaPierre ran away and hit on a boat what when the sandy hook shooting start and i think that you know that that kind of irresponsibility i i don't know how you can um reach reach across the aisle so to speak with somebody who doesn't believe that the sky is the same color you believe it is well our texas governor uh greg abbott spoke out today against what joe biden has been saying about you know gun control and saying he thinks he's going to take away our Second Amendment rights, but that's not going to happen in Texas. We're going to stand up to that. We're going to become a sanctuary state for gun rights. And almost immediately after Abbott made that speech, there was another mass shooting here in Texas, in Bryan. So yeah. it's like, you know, it's kind of delusional to keep throwing gasoline on the fire of this gun thing and uh sooner or later somebody's got to speak up and say enough enough and i think biden was trying well, to he, do that yeah that's isn't that what this new ghost gun executive order is supposed to be yeah yeah i mean what, what i don't understand why people are so freaked out about that it's you know what is the big deal how is that because pe people believe some people believe that the second amendment of the constitution guarantees them a right to have a destructive weapon in their hands and to if they choose to murder a bunch of people you know yeah well but most of the people who are um licensed don't commit that kind of violence the majority of the people who commit those kinds of crimes do not have license. They are not registered. They're not. Are you sure? Are you sure? I because there, I know there's some, some who have committed those I crimes that had legal weapons. And I know there are some too, but the overwhelming majority is not. And I, I will, I'm only speaking for Texas because those are the, the, uh, uh, the numbers that I have and Alan Pogue, I don't know. You know he's a, a photojournalist and he, he teaches. Yeah, I remember we talked to him one time. Yeah, yeah, sort of. <laughs> so. uh, and um, he he has he's he follows this very closely, and he now teaches uh, firearm safety. So these are these are real numbers. Uh, it's it, we have the rules, we just don't enforce them. Well, what I keep telling people, and what I hear a lot of Democrats say, is hey, nobody's trying to take away your guns or nobody's trying to do away with the Second Amendment. And today, when I heard about that other shooting, I thought, you know, maybe it's time that we said, hey, yeah, we're coming for your guns and we want to squash the Second Amendment or at least squash the misinterpretation of it that you have that makes you think that you have the right to have, uh, you know, a, an arsenal of weapons in your basement. I mean, maybe it's time for us to just start saying, no, these guns should not be So uh, what do you do? I mean, do you available? literally go to these people's homes and take their guns? Because, I mean, if Jade Helm showed us anything, it's that they'll bury those motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll go dig them up later. I'm just wondering what the practicality would be. I, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, really, the guns don't work very well after they've been buried. It's kind of hard to put the genie back in the bottle when there's that many genies out there. And well, it's it, the, in reality, just closing some of the loopholes will help a little bit. Well, you it's, know, just, it's just interesting to me, too, having been deep in the heart of Texas and now um, up in uh, northern New Mexico, <laughs> like the difference in the tone is you know i keep thinking about the fuel on the fire you're talking about john right it's just you don't because we have in my mind a governor 
who's somewhat lucid and intelligent and forthright, um, Governor Grisham. And, you know, you don't have the same kind of rhetoric like you have in Texas. And people have guns here, of course. People hunt for elk and deer and stuff like that. But there's not this kind of mania that I remember being in Texas. It's just a, like night and day. Yeah, no, um, they're kind of nuts. And, if you want and, to see mania, go to a gun show sometime. That'll... And well, and, and that what, did is today, <laughs> what did I read today that uh, you, you all probably read it, you know, more completely, but something about the majority of the people that have been indicted in the Capitol um, uh, insurrection are te it's Texans. It's like I majority know, Texans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I yeah. mean, I, the Texas flag, I saw a rainbow flag. <laughs> And I, I know I did that exact thing. I was like, oh my God. Yeah, okay. the Texas flags were everywhere. I I would just note that we have a little less than five minutes left, more like four minutes left. And Gary has patiently heard us rant and rave about guns for a bit. But <laughs> Gary, you are our guest and you ought to do the summary here. You ought to close us out. What uh, have you got to say? No. <laughs> you don't have to talk about guns. I think the topical drift here is uh, uh, kind of been uh, uh, the voice of uh, what the people are feeling right now. Uh, <laughs> what's what your solution? Yeah. Should we? Well, you know, I don't have a solution, but I think if you have a mentality that's a national or personal or an ideological sense of uh, violence as the answer to solving the world's problems, selling the world guns, creating an atmosphere in which the personal sense of fear, which is natural as a human being, as an entity, as a living species, becomes on a larger order of scale and complexity, it becomes a military, it becomes a gun show, it becomes all of these things. As for me, it's about understanding and reducing and, and changing it from consciousness. Mm -hmm. And programs like Plutopia, you know, have the opportunity to uh, spread the word that you know, if guns are the answer, what's the problem? The Second Amendment comes from the from the slave era, you know, where, uh oh, what if, what if, what if them, got, what if they get our ornery? Oh, we got to have a gun, you know, because they're property, we can't kill them, right? So it, to me, it's a matter of changing consciousness at the base. One thing I would think of is, and you know this well, Gary. My two my cents. May all beings be safe. May all beings be happy. May all beings have peace. That, that's one way to do it. And it begins with yourself. It's not, you know, I mean, the meta prayer is something you start with yourself and then you include your family and friends, and then you include an indifferent person that's like the grocer that you see. And then you pick somebody that's like, you know, that Democrat or that Republican that you just sets off your buttons and you realize, hey, there are just bozos on the bus like us. You know, until eventually, you know, how do you evolve? It's like you realize that we, you know, we as a species can, we can do this. It's like, this is the opposable thumb here guys <laughs> and to bring it all back home you know lawrence was you know he when i did this anthology what book which includes you know 150 people but includes beats and and so forth the poems influenced by the buddha it really wasn't hard picking poems by lawrence because he's a buddha lawrence really was awake to his buddha nature he published in a magazine called The Journal for the Protection of All Beings. I remember Back in that. the 60s. I remember that. Uh, so, you know, to me, I just, I 
kind of just stay on this path. I see what's going on with great, you know, uh, heart-rending grief, but we're timed out. <laughs> perfect, perfect timing. Perfect timing. Thank you so much, Gary. It's always a joy to have you here with us. Oh, it's a pleasure, a privilege, and a heavenly delight. And remember, we're all bozos on this bus. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. That's why I'm here. <laughs> right on. Okay, okay well, thanks, everybody. Way out. Thanks. I'm Have going to uh, lock the door and throw away the key. Okay. No, no, we'll be back next week. That's right. <laughs> Thank Bye. you. Good seeing thanks, you, Maggie, Gary. Susie, Scoop, John. Nice to see you too, Gary. Hope to see Bye -bye. you face to face soon.